I, I hate to interrupt your conversations. <laughs> It is. Good morning. It's a joy to be together in the house of the Lord today. Uh, a joy to worship. You can see my camper is up there somewhere because my wife and I are on our way to Seneca Hills for the week. We were not going to go until tomorrow. My wife and I are Bible teachers, but they want a board member there when Lyndon's not there. And Lyndon and his wife just had a new baby on Friday night, late Friday. So Kim and I will be there. Our only role is to call parents if parents could need to need to be called. You know, that's a, so that you know that would be our role at Seneca this week. Other announcements: there's there's a brief session meeting, a brief discipleship meeting after church today. Anything else that needs to be highlighted here? I don't believe so. Why don't we? We'll stay seated, but look around and say hi. <laughs> and wave to people. <laughs> and tell people it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> and we have an announcement. Good morning, everyone. So I am excited to announce to you two things that were decided at our session meeting on Monday. <clears throat> Number one, the session voted to approve the construction of pickleball courts. And number two, the session approved the seeking of donations from the community to offset the cost. So we really have been praying about this for months and months and discussing and taking into account everyone's thoughts, both for and against, and uh, we're excited to be moving forward with this project. And uh, we will be having more information to share with you in the weeks and months to come as we start nailing down more specific details about where the courts are gonna be, be located and how, what, what this ministry is gonna look like. So we will be sure to share those with you as they are decided. But as I say, we're excited to have made this decision and be moving forward with this ministry. Thanks. If you know business contacts, by the way, you know, let us know, B business uh, contacts, contact about possible donations. The, the, there's already a fairly significant amount of monies that's been given to it through business contacts. So we are excited about um, this possibility. Any other announcements to highlight today? Call to worship. Do, do. Psalm 62 is our call to worship. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I would never be forsaken. How long will you assault a, a man? Would all of you throw him down this leaning wall, this, this, this tottering fence? They fully intend to topple him from his lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. We get to worship our Lord today. Why don't we stand and worship? Thank you, Pastor Doug. Good morning and welcome. Let's worship the God that is our rock and our salvation. For you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you. Out of darkness, out of darkness, out of darkness, into his marvelous light, into his marvelous light. Okay, chosen generation. Ready? For you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar. Your people, that you should show forth the praises of 
of him who has called you out of darkness, out of darkness, out of darkness, into his marvelous light, into his marvelous light, into his marvelous light, into I delight myself in you, in the glory of your presence. And I'm overwhelmed, and I'm overwhelmed by you. And God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed, and I'm overwhelmed. You are beautiful, you are beautiful, oh God, there is no one more beautiful, you are beautiful, God, you are the most beautiful, you are wonderful, you are wonderful. God, there is no one more wonderful. You are wonderful. God, you are the most wonderful. You are glorious. You are glorious. Oh, God, there is no one more glorious. You are glorious. God, you are the most glorious. I delight myself in you, in the glory of your presence. I'm overwhelmed, and I'm overwhelmed by you. God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed, and I'm overwhelmed by you. I'm overwhelmed by you. Amen. This week, um, as I was watching TV, I heard a pastor um, on, tr on, on television, and he, and he wrote it. He said a quote, and it, it really st it stuck with me. And I would like to read this to you, if I may. He said, if all you see, excuse me, he said, if what you see is all you see, then what you see isn't all that can be seen. Now read that again. If what you see is all that you see, then what you see isn't all that can be seen. Um, I thought about that quite a bit uh, this past week. And uh, there's so much um, God has in store for us, both on this earth and both in heaven, that we have not the slightest, we, we don't have the capacity to see the fullness of it. Amen? Amen? But he calls us to gather and to talk about his greatness. Gather round, ye children, come. Listen to the old, old story of the power of death undone by an infant born of glory, Son of God, Son of Man. Gather round, remember now how creation held its breath. How it let out a sigh, filled with the skies with the angel, Son of God, Son of Man. So sing out with joy for the brave little boy who was God, but he made himself nothing. Well, he gave up his pride and he came here to die like a man. If 
for God exalted him to the place of highest praises and he gave him a name above every name that at the very name of Jesus son of God we would sing out with joy for the brave little boy who was God but he made himself nothing his pride and he came here to die like a man so in heaven and earth below every knee would bow and worship every tongue would proclaim that Jesus he reigns with the angels so sing out with joy for the brave little boy who was God but he nothing oh he gave up his pride and he came here to die like a man gather round me children come listen to the old old story of the power of death undone by an infant born of glory son of God Oh, come with rejoicing, the Father is calling Those who would worship in spirit and truth Come with your singing and come with thanksgiving Savior has made all things new. Oh, come and rejoice, O oh, holy nation. Come and sing praises to Him. Come and bow down and worship before Him. Jesus, the King of all kings. Jesus, the King of all kings. Lord of creation is full of compassion, seated in splendor, adorned with all grace, majestic and glorious, reigning victorious, now and forever, enthroned on our praise. Come and rejoice, O holy nation, come and sing praises to him. before him Jesus the king of all kings Jesus the king of all kings with the sound of the trumpet he summons the nations calling the priesthood to go in his name to show forth his power to this generation to worship before him a kingdom of praise Oh, come and rejoice, O oh, holy nation. Come and sing praises to him. Come and bow down and worship before him. Jesus, the King of all kings. Jesus, the King of all kings. I'm going to finish this morning with... Uh, Ancient words talk about the scriptures that just bless our walk. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Changing me and me. 
unchanging love we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words embark holy words of our faith handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice oh heed the long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. The ancient words ever true, changing me and changing Please be seated. Oh, Lord God, that indeed is our prayer, that we would hear your words, that we would hear your truth. Ancient words, but also present words. You are the word. You have given to us your written word. What a tremendous, tremendous gift that is, Lord God. Your word revealing who you are, revealing your call to us as your children, revealing your plans for the future, revealing your love and your care, your holiness. Praise you and thank you. You are a God who has made yourself known to us. You are a God who revealed your love in the cross, revealed your power in the resurrection, revealed your promise in the coming again. Ancient words ever true, still true in our lives. Lord, we do pray that you will guide us as, an, as individuals and as a nation that we can be your people. Lord, yes, we praise and thank you for this day, the opportunity to worship, Lord. We just rest in this family of believers. We just rest with brothers and sisters in Christ, worshiping you. Praise be to God that we can be at this place at this time. Lord, we do think of those who are not able to be with us, those who need your hand of healing, those who are providing care for others. Lord, we do pray for Denise and especially for her sister, Debbie, Lord, who is mourning the loss of her husband, Howard. Be with them, Lord Jesus, safeties and travels for Denise, Lord. Touch Debbie as she mourns her loss. Be with this entire family, Lord Jesus. Lord, that reminds us of others who are still in the process of grief. And we know sometimes that is, is days, months, and often years, Lord Jesus. We praise you and thank you that you are the great comforter, that you have given us a body of believers to love and care for each other. Praise you and thank you. Lord God, we do. We do pray for those who are ill. We pray for your healing hand upon them, that you would touch them and be with them, Lord. And Lord, even if your will is to bring them into your presence, we praise you. For we know heaven indeed is a glorious place, a place of eternity, of worshiping you. Praise be and thank you, O Lord God. Again, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would descend upon us, that your ancient words will teach us and guide us, 
not just intellectual truth, but real daily living truth. We would hear, gain understanding through your spirit, and a call to action to live your word. Praise you and thank you. And Lord, we come to you with a prayer that you did teach us, and together we do pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, brother. We have the opportunity once again to turn to God's word to teach and guide us. My text this morning is the same text we had last week, if you remember that. I said last week it was a two-part sermon. That last week I gave, it was, I think I said last week it was five, but it's since only being four lessons. I gave three last week and only one lesson this morning. But I have to give you fair warning. That one lesson has six subparts. Just so you know, it's coming. Let me read the text. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 5, 11 through 6, 3. This is the word of God. We have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with a teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave behind the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of, and now you're going to hear the six points I'm going to give, the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, faith in God, instructions about baptism, the laying out of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. Again, Lord, we thank you for your word and your truth. Would we, we would hear you, Lord Jesus, and only you. Praise you and thank you. In Christ's name, amen. We are looking at the need for spiritual maturity. I grew up in a suburb of Buffalo, and there was this man, I would guess he was in his 40s or something like that, who would constantly be wandering in the community. His name was Albert. And Albert had special needs. And I remember asking my mom, what's wrong with Albert? And he said, well, Albert is, and at this time, you know, again, language, just, Albert is, is retarded. It was a word used then, not so much now. And although he has the body of an adult, he has the mind of an eight or nine-year-old. And I thought, oh, how, how sad. But then I got to know Albert. He was wandering, we were playing, and Albert would just, you know, as, as I and my friends were playing, would stand and watch and talk and, and talk to him and discovered this about Albert. He was happy. He had faith in Jesus as an eight or nine year old. And he enjoyed life. He knew almost everyone in the community because he wandered around, didn't know their names, but he knew them. And he was a blessing, a blessing to me and to other people who met Albert, this person with special needs. But then I thought of this analogy, how sad it is for a man who, who does not have special needs would make the choice to be an eight or nine-year-old infant mentally. How tragic that would be. And yet, how tragic it is when that happens in our spiritual life. So many people who are adults remain spiritually immature. 
and how tragic and sad that is. Our text is a command to grow in faith, to not remain spiritually immature, to not remain on a milk diet, but to grow in faith. Four lessons. If I would take my mic and test you for the three I gave last week, I am sure every one of you could remember the three I gave last week. Lessons on growing in faith. Lesson number one, to grow in our faith, we must never slip into spiritual satisfaction. We must always be moving forward. Never satisfied. That doesn't mean unhappy, but not satisfied. Not, not just saying, oh, I am where I am. That's where I'm going to stay. Isn't that tragic? I can't, I can't repeat these sermons. <laughs> Oliver Cromwell said this, he who ceases to be better ceases to be good. I thought that was an interesting quote. That's number two. Spiritual growth occurs by constant use of God's word. You remember the illustration of the baby and eating food, right? You remember illustrations. That's why I give illustrations, because you remember illustrations. And how the baby believes when, when he, he or she first begins eating food that it's best done by absorption through the skin. Okay? They just smear it everywhere, and hopefully they hope it gets in it, which it doesn't. Which it doesn't. We do not grow in God's word by absorption of his word. And I, this is not so true so much, but I used to visit people a number of years ago, and they, they often had a family Bible out, which is fine. That's good. You know, and they had, you know, you open it up and you have the genealogies in the family Bible. But a family Bible or any Bible sitting on a table is absolutely worthless. Is absolutely worthless. We are to grow by const daily use, every day growing in God's word. That's number three. Christian growth occurs in daily surrender to Jesus Christ. Remember I said, don't just surrender your life, surrender every day, every relationship, every thought, every action. Surrender to Christ day and day. That's number four, which is the new lesson for today. Christian growth occurs by building on a solid foundation of truth. Let me read verse 1 and 2 of chapter 6. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of. And here, here's my challenge. Here are foundational issues that we should know in the first year or two that we are a Christian. Do you have this foundation? Foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, faith in God, instructions about baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of, of the dead, and eternal judgment. Over the years, I've known a number of people who have built their own homes. Um, I don't know if you were ever part of, of building their own homes. Like I had a number of people, I would just, just Friday night, we had friends in Portersville. And we went to Brown's in Portersville, if you know Brown's, to eat. And these friends who were from New Bedford, I said, let's take a tour, because I had a, you know, my, my first full-time pastor was in Portersville, Mountville. It was a suburb of Portersville. <laughs> Sound toward Elwood City, down 488. And as we were just visiting, we had finished dinner. I said, well, let's go. Anyone here seen Cleland's Rock? You really have to know to know it. It's part of McConnell's Mill, but if you don't know where it is, you don't know where it is. It's down side roads, it's, and it's just a rock overlooking the entire Slippery Rock Valley. It's very beautiful. But I, we also did a tour, and I showed him the first house, you know, that my wife and I lived in as a pastor. It was, it was a manse, and my wife and I had the privilege of being the first people to ever live in this house. They just built it, which meant, and my toddler children which meant every time they would take a magic marker onto the brand new carpet, we would be, feel bad about that because it was a brand new, brand new house. Um, 
And then we took them up and showed them where the, where, where the church is. Building your own house. Oh, I know what this, the point was. There was a house right across the street from us that they built. This guy was building from scratch. At least eight or nine years, he lived in his basement. Remember how you just live in a, live in a basement? You know, you just you know, have it covered and just black tarp in a basement before he built the rest of the house. But imagine this. You're building a house. But, you know, building costs are pretty high. And therefore, you make the decision that in order to save some money, you're not going to put in a foundation. You're not going to put a footer in. You're just going to put some stone down there and start building. After all, you just can't see the foundation anyways. So why put any money under the ground that you're not going to see? What would be the end result of that build? Well, this church knows when you don't have a good foundation on a building, right? If you don't have a good foundation on a building, it's going to sink at different times and different spaces. Foolishness to not build the foundation that we need. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says this, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day, and day is capitalized, by the way, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and fire will test the quality of each man's work. Our foundation is Jesus Christ, and that foundation in our lives will be tested with fire. What is the foundation of your life? The absolute, what is holding you up? What is holding you up above everything else? In difficult times, when there is fire in your life, what is holding you up? Let's look at some of the building blocks that, that we, the author of Hebrews gives us as a foundation of our lives. Building block number one, repentance from acts that lead to death. Repentance. Repentance. You cannot be a Christian without repentance. Repentance is, is, is a simple word. I, I think I've said this before. It does not necessarily only have a religious meaning. It could have a secular word. You could say, I was going to the store, realized I forgot my wallet, repented, and went home to get my wallet. It means to turn around. To turn around. To make a new direction in life. You see, the, the sad truth is this. We live in a day and age when people believe that to be a Christian is just something else you add to your life. It's an add-on. Now, you keep everything else, but you continue but you begin a belief in Jesus Christ. And that is having no foundation whatsoever. First John says this. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away your sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. I, I was thinking of a joke, but I can't tell that joke. Um, we, no one here, you know, raise your hand if you are sinless. <laughs> no one is sinless. We continue to b struggle with sin. I would not make you share them. But this text is saying, because we have repented, because we have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we understand that sin is sin. We are honest with ourselves. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, sometimes over a great deal of time, we have the power to overcome sin because of repentance, because of the power of the Holy Spirit in us. A true 
Christian life is a changed life. We are saved by grace. Let me again share a text, 2 Corinthians 5. And Christ died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. So many people think, I can, I, I'm a Christian. Now, I don't really believe in going to church. I still, you know, live a life of anger and bitterness. I still live with my old practices that I've lived before, but I believe in Jesus. James says, so you believe in God? So do all the devils in hell and shudder in terror. My dear short-sighted man, faith without actions is worthless and dead. We are saved by grace. Never, ever, ever do I want to say that it's a work process. By, we are not saved by being good. We are not. We are not saved by coming to church. We're not saved by, by living good moral lives. However, grace, true grace, changes our lives. It makes us a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. Yes, we as Christians should stand out in darkness. And I'll be honest with you, and as I look to society these days, our light should be shining forth brighter and brighter and brighter as darkness sweeps across the land. Christian light should be seen. Not in my nose, but first century Christians. First century people came to Christ by the thousands. You know, within 300 years, it went from nothing to an official religion of Rome. 300 years. What attracted people to Jesus Christ? We hear accounts, we've read accounts. This is one of the number one things that we read. Christians know how to die. We know how to die because Christ is our hope and our Savior. Christians shine forth in a dark, dark world. Praise be to God. Building block number two. To grow in Christ, we need faith in God. Faith does not mean intellectual assent. Faith means surrender to Jesus Christ, to depend upon, depend upon. I made this point last week, so I'm just going to touch it. We need to continually depend upon God and not upon ourselves. It's so difficult for us to surrender because we want to be self-dependent. As Christians, we learn to be Christ-dependent, relying upon him and not ourselves. Building block number three, instructions about baptism. Instructions about baptism. Isn't that an interesting one? Baptism. What does baptism do? Most important, what does baptism not do? Baptism has nothing to do with salvation. That's important to hear and to know. Baptism, isn't it amazing how many people think, because I'm baptized, that makes me a Christian, and I'm going to heaven. No matter what I do, I could be a mafia hitman all these movies, you know. I could be the Don and have these big baptismal ce celebrations, you see, you know, these movies. And that's fine because I've been baptized. And nothing could be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, in that way, baptism can be very, very negative. Instructions about, so what does baptism do? And by the way, this is true whether you do infant baptism or whether you do adult believer's baptism. What does baptism 
do. It makes you part of the Christian family. It does not make you a Christian, but it makes you part of the church. Now, again, not everyone who is in the church is saved. We know that. But it does make you part. It is the equivalent of the Old Testament ceremony of circumcision, which makes the baby boy into the Jewish family. It makes them Jewish. Baptism brings a person into the Christian family. And yes, says Romans chapter 3, there are many, many blessings to being part of the Christian family. So it is important. But it is not, repent, it is not salvation. It's a sign of vows. Vows. Parents make vows when they baptize their infant. By the way, why do they call confirmation in a Presbyterian church confirmation class? Why isn't it called teenage new members class? Why is it always called a confirmation class? Anybody know? Because you are confirming the vows that your parents made for you, now you are making. The vows of baptism are the identical vows of confirmation. The vows that parents made for you, if you were, if you were baptized as an infant, or if you were dedicated as an infant, either one, is the same vows that you make when you make it at your confirmation. You confirm your own faith. Now, does that mean when you make a vow that as a parent, or as you do it, as do it yourself, if, if you're in adult baptism, does that say that I, I vow that I will raise this child as a Christian. Does that mean that you are accountable to bringing that child to Sunday school and you will be judged if you don't? Yes. Simple answer. Yes. Let me read Deuteronomy. I always read in, a, in my, my pre-baptism counseling, I always read this text, Deuteronomy 23. If you make a vow to your Lord, your God, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, do not be slow to pay it for the Lord, your God, will certainly demand it of you, and you will be guilty of sin if you disobey. If you refrain from making a vow, you will not be guilty. Whatever your lips utter, you must be sure to do, because you made your vow free to the Lord, your God, with your own mouth. Are we responsible for the public vows that we make to God? Think how often you make public vows to God. Very seldom. Marriage, baptism, joining the church, ordination. There might be a fifth one in there. I can't remember what it would be. Very, very seldom. We are accountable to God for those vows that we make. So when we, raise, when we bring our children forth for baptism, we are accountable to, or for dedication. I could get into a, a, a discussion of, of infant baptism versus dedication. It's not in my notes, by the way. Um, why we as Presbyterians baptize babies, this is not in my notes at all, is because we, we stress the sovereignty and grace of God. Understand that. When we baptize an infant baby, we are saying, Lord God, I give this child to you, and I know this child is in your hands to be called by you to be your follower. Adult baptism sometimes mis um, incorrectly says it's because a person has accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. Believer's baptism. What is that? That's not grace. That is the person making the decision to be a Christian. You understand the difference there? Infant baptism stresses, stresses the absolute sovereignty and grace of God. Adult baptism stresses the human action of being a Christian. By the way, a final thing, which is not in my notes. There's one thing that I cannot do as a Presbyterian pastor. 
Can I baptize babies, of course? Can I baptize adults, teenagers? Yes. Can I rebaptize? If they had been baptized as a child, and one would come to me as a teenager and says, you know, I want to do something that I can remember. I want a, 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 a memorable experience. Will you rebaptize me? No. Why? Because that, because you're only baptized once, right? You're only baptized once. And to rebaptize a person denies the infant baptism. And I can't deny the infant baptism. What would I say in that situation? We're going to get onto that in a minute, by the way. What would I say to a person? I said, you know, that's a, I understand. You want to share, share with your church family the joy of being his child. And you want to share that. Here's what we'll do. We would do an anointing with oil. Same vows. Same ceremony, but you don't use water. You anoint with oil. Because anointing with oil is very, very biblical for, for major steps in life. People who are anointed, prophets who are called, people who are called are anointed with oil. So you can make a public statement. Boy, I'm really, my, not my notes now. That's why I shouldn't get away from my notes. <laughs> Baptism. Building block. Next building block is this. The laying on of hands. This is a basic fundamental. What is the laying on of, on of hands? Do we do this? We do. We do. The laying on of hands is done when we ordain. We have people come up and we lay on of hands. And at healing ceremonies. Also, I anoint with oil when we do healing. If a person comes to me and says, you know, I'm suffering this illness. Scripture says people with illness were often anointed with oil. Could you and, and some of the elders come and have a time of laying out of hands and anointing with oil? Again, it's not miraculous, but it's affirming God's strength and God's promise to people. It's affirming that God cares and loves. It's a call of God to an act of service and it's the receiving of the Holy Spirit to act in obedience, laying out of hands. It's a symbol of receiving the Holy Spirit and being called into a life of service, which every person, every Christian is called to a life of service. Building block number five. Next two are pretty easy. The resurrection of the dead. Christ's resurrection and our resurrection. Fundamental. Do we live knowing that Christ is alive? Do we live knowing that Christ is always with you? Always. Always. When you are in an argument with a spouse, maybe an argument with your kids, do you remember, even in the midst of those emotions, that Christ is with you? In all situations, Christ, the Holy Spirit, is with us. The resurrection of the dead. Do you live knowing that you have eternal life? Do you live knowing that you have eternal life. Let me, when I was on vacation last week, we, we had people from New Bedford who came, came off, uh, two different couples, and spent some time. We were boating, and, and we were talking about some of the, the meaningful things that were done at New Bedford. And one couple, Sam and Janine, very, very close friends, said mission trips. 
probably for 10 years, something like that, New Bedford Church had mission trips to, to San Luis, Mexico, just over the border um, from Phoenix um, down you know, into Mexico. And let me share with you what, what more than anything else taught me in these mission trips. And I've taken mission trips to, to Bolivia, to Brazil, to Haiti a few years, just three, four years ago, and many, many times to Mexico. It shows, one, it teaches one thing. You see people, tremendous men and women of Christ who understand this truth. You live for your eternity, not your life here. Because your life here, for these people in third world countries, cannot, it is not easy. It is not easy in any way, and I can tell story after story after story. We spent, every time we would go to the dump, um, because the dump is where people scavenge for food, the poorest of the poor. And we would bring food, rice and beans, and share and have a, a service about Christ at the city dump. We did this year after year after year. But going to church, Going to church in Mexico was some, one of the greatest experiences I've ever had. Poor people. We went out, out into the outer, the outer regions. Very, very poor. Very, very hot in these buildings, sit, sitting on just wooden benches. And it's, it's amazing truth, though. I mean, whenever we would come, it was maybe 10 to 15 of us in our mission trip. The people who were seated would always get up and go stand in the back and let the Americans sit down. It was a two-hour service, at least. All right, but they would stand in the back. And their love for Christ and their understanding that they do not live for the here and now. We are blessed unbelievably blessed. The danger is this. Because of the blessings, we live for the here and now. We pile up the blessings that we have. The truth about the resurrection. We live primarily for our eternity, not for the here and now. Finally, building block number six. The truth of eternal judgment. Every person will stand before the judge. Every person. And every person will stand before the judge guilty. We're all guilty. The only difference is this. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We live in a day and age where people forget about eternal life and they forget about judgment, right? We live in a day and age where the vast, you go to the street and interview people and you'd say, do you believe in the judgment of God? And even so many Christians say, oh, no, no, no. I would never, you know, believe in the judgment of God. And yet it is one of the most central teachings in Scripture. Now, it's, it's good news for us who are Christians. We understand that. But woe to you, says Scripture, if you are not prepared for the coming of the Lord. Woe to you, says Scripture, the woes. Woe to you, says Scripture, if you go into his presence and have not prepared by surrender to Jesus Christ. Fundamental truth to live our life by. The truth of Jesus. Now, we, we live in a day and age where we don't give what's called hell and damnation sermons. I used to read Jonathan Edwards, read, read some of the tremendous sermons that were given two, three hundred years ago. Tremendous sermons, a spider. Anyways, I can't. Um, but the truth remains the same. 
the truth remains the same. Repent, turn to Jesus Christ, because the path you are on, if you don't turn around, will lead to hell, period. Repent and come to Jesus Christ. Experience his love and his grace. I will close in prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The foundations of truth that you've given to us. Praise you and thank you. The foundation of repentance. The foundation of faith. The foundation about baptism. Laying on of hands. Resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Help each and every one of us, Lord, to grow in faith. Forgive me for my times of complacency. Forgive me for my times of spiritual satisfaction. Help us to grow closer and closer to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Would you please stand? And as we close this service today, would you please bring as an offering to our good, good Father an offering of our appreciation and gratitude and worship for his grace.
I'm going to show you this morning the benediction from the book of Hebrews, since I won't get this far. Here's this benediction. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to him be forever, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Turn it around, God, turn it around, God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything, yes. God, turn it around, God, turn it around, God, turn it around. All of my heart is in the name. 